We've covered shows, we've covered movies. What about taking a look at some Star Trek rides? This time, we're taking a look at Copernicus Station, a space station that appeared in the real life Star Trek themed attraction, Star Trek The Experience, and one of its rides, Star Trek The Borg Invasion 4D. Did you go on these by the way? Let me know in the comment section. So this time in our Star Trek Starship Starbase Space Station Explained series, we'll be taking a look at this unique Starbase, and what we know about it both in-universe and out. Let's take a look. Welcome to Trek Central, I'm your host Captain Jack and let's get into it. Before we do warp into this video, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. As always, please let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, because if you're talking about Star Trek, then we want to hear about it. Okay, engage. Copernicus Station was a space station under the control of Starfleet in the late 24th century. It was located in the Beta Quadrant on the border of the Delta Quadrant, and was at the time one of the furthest Federation facilities in the direction of the Delta Quadrant. Copernicus Station was 681 metres wide and 468 metres high. The station had a somewhat unique design compared to other Starfleet space facilities, but still maintained a Starfleet aesthetic to it. The station had a central disk-like structure reminiscent of most Starfleet and Federation space stations. On top of the dish was a more of a framework looking tower, which might have served as the station's communication system. Considering the station was on the edge of a Delta Quadrant, it would require a complex communication system to communicate effectively with Starfleet. The disc was separated into thirds by pylons that extend to other disc docking structures. These were multi-deck structures with large windows around the rim, but were also places for large ships to dock on the rim of these discs. On the other side were long antennas which struck down. There was a landing pad on top which presumably could move shuttles or smaller vessels inside these structures similar to the shuttle pads on Deep Space Nine. From the central disk, the station extended down, similar to most space dock type space stations, with the station having a further three disks, but much smaller, with the same layer of large rimmed windows, shuttle pad, and places for larger ships to dock. At least one of these thirds on the main central disk had a large shuttle bay, which could house numerous shuttles with some small vessels. This was referred to as Docking Bay 2, which is right next to Section 3. The station had your conventional Class 2 shuttlecraft, but more interesting was the unique shuttle, the Olympia, that was also present at Copernicus Station. The Olympia shuttle was a much sleeker than your conventional Starfleet shuttle design, resembling almost an arrowhead design with extremely embedded nacelles and a deflector system. The shuttle was used for mass transport personnel and had a main internal holding area with seats of 48 people. In this holding area was also a main console with at least two seats, at the front and a massive view screen. A very important aspect of the Olympia class of shuttle was it was very resilient and had a very effective emergency force field system in case of a hull breach. The entire front of the vessel could be torn open and the force field system would ensure that no occupants would be vented into space. How effective this system was however is not known, it was only seen in use once. Depending on where the system was housed on the shuttle, some damage may cripple its ability to erect such emergency force fields. Returning to Copernicus Station, all we know of the interior, apart from that being a standard staff interior design of the 2370s, was that the lab complex and research facility Alpha seemed to be located in and around Section 3. As expected, the station would have a central command centre where the command of the station and their staff could operate it from. Though this command centre was seemingly much smaller than your conventional Starfleet bridge. The command centre also looked to have only standing terminals with no central chair for the commanding officer. I'd personally like a desk like Captain Sisko, but that's just me. As an advanced research facility, the station came equipped with a number of labs and equipment to assist their function. Entrance to the facility had visitors walk through scanners which performed bioscans. These contained thermal imaging sensors, parasitic cell space scanners and EM scanners, being able to quickly identify genetic fragments. The rest of the medical lab would have equipment to allow researchers aboard to continue their advanced research, but only medical research has been shown, being a star is located on the edge of a Delta Quadrant. Other research might have also been done on the station. As a Starfleet station in the 2370s, the station did come equipped with standard defensive and offensive capabilities. The station had shields and had phaser and torpedo emplacements. Phasers seemed to line the lower rim of a central disc, with a few other emplacements on this phase. Torpedoes, which could be fired in rapid succession, came from above the docking bays. 
With Copernicus Station being positioned on the edge of a Delta Quadrant, it had access to a whole new area of space only visited by the USS Voyager, and I guess also the USS Equinox, Amelia Earhart, and those two Ferengi who pretend to be prophets. So you know, just a few. Having a station on this frontier meant that new civilizations were formally met by Starfleet, including the Voth who had sent one of their smaller ships to the station on one occasion. This also meant that, being near the Delta Quadrant, Copernicus Station was closer to Borg space as well. The station itself was an advanced research facility, which housed research on a variety of special projects, with one such project being called Project Resistance. This project was worked on by Chief Medical Officer of the Copernicus Station, the Doctor, who was an emergency medical hologram from the USS Voyager, and had gained sentience and personhood during the Voyager's long return to the Alpha Quadrant from 2371 to 2378. Project Resistance was a project by the Doctor to develop protections not only against a far larger array of alien viruses and bacteria, but also against the assimilation process utilised by the Borg Collective. The Borg Collective was a hive mind collective of cyborgs beings that resided in the Delta Quadrant, and forcibly converted people to join their collective through a process known as assimilation, where nanoprobes were injected into the target to take them over and turn them into a Borg drone. Project Resistance would study volunteers in hopes of finding an already identifiable rare base pair sequence in their DNA to develop these protections. In order to isolate this rare base pair sequence, a large sample size was required to isolate the genetic fragment. Even if a project did not develop into protection against nanoprobes, the developments in resistance against a whole host of other viruses and bacteria would be revolutionary. Parasitic subspace scanners would be used on groups to find genetic matches, and those found of a rare base pair sequence would be studied. In 2379, a group of volunteers for the project were discovered with the rare base pair sequence in their DNA, and were going to be studied by the Doctor in order to help isolate the sequence. However, somehow, the Borg Collective became aware of this and dispatched a cube to Copernicus Station, to destroy the research and capture the individuals first possibly to even adapt to this resistance before Starfleet could develop anything against it. As we all know, resistance is futile. The cube would use its cutting beam and weaponry to rip the outer hull of Section 3 off the station, rendering the insides of the station exposed. This included research facility Alpha, where the project resistance was being run from. Borg drones would then be transported onto the station, assimilating Starfleet personnel and affecting the station's computer system. Though these volunteers would escape, they would be captured by the Borg cube and taken inside the vessel. There they would encounter avian Borg drones, which had beam emitters that were more vulnerable than normal Borg drones. The Borg Queen would also be present, because of course she would, to personally oversee the assimilation of those considered to have the cure of assimilation, and have her own personal shielded platform. She would utilise a new type of Borg weaponry which would introduce the nanoprobes as a mist to infect their targets. Though these individuals would temporarily be apart and see through the eyes of the Collective, the Doctor would inject his own programming into the Collective to communicate with the group and remind them of who they are. That, coupled with their natural resistance to assimilation, would help them resist the assimilation process. Now, this is the cool bit. Vice Admiral Janeway of the USS Voyager would be nearby and attack the cube, entering inside the cube and destroying it from inside, using a track to beam to tow the remains of the Olympia shuttle back to Copernicus Station. In 2380, a year after the Borg attack on the station, the Doctor would be made Chief Medical Officer of the Copernicus Station and go away to a medical conference at Space Station Domedius 1, a regular Type 1 space station. What remains of the Copernicus Station by the time of Starship Picard is unknown. Now, for those who don't know already, the whole situation as well as Copernicus Station was from Star Trek The Experience, and specifically the ride of Star Trek The Borg Invasion 4D. Now, this experience ride would let people experience the story as a group of volunteers for Project Resistance, trying to flee from a Borg and being rescued by the USS Voyager and Vice Admiral Janeway. For those who are keen to ask the question, is this canon? The answer is no. Even though this is the case, I'm sure it was an amazing experience for those who attended the ride in Star Trek The Experience when it was still open. It also gave us some amazing designs made by some of the legendary Star Trek creatives. The design of Copernicus Station was created by well-known Trek creative John Eves, responsible for many ship designs in Star Trek, such as the Enterprise E. The model was done by Doug Drexler, created the NX-01, and many other ships and designs as well. He actually had no idea what he was building, the Copernicus Station model or Olympia Shuttle 4, he thought the Olympia Shuttle might be the Star Trek Enterprise as a concept of a space shuttle OV-165 Spike that can be seen in the intro and also Star Trek Picard Season 2. The final model would be sent to Threshold, a VFX company that did the rest of the work for the Borg Invasion. Threshold had access to the models used on prior Star Trek series, had access to the Borg Cube and USS Voyager models which were used for the ride. Fabio Passaro, notable Star Trek contributor and someone who unfortunately passed away last year, 
would contribute to the Borg invasion by creating the Borg cube interior, and would say the scene consisted of nearly 3 million polygons and so was built to strict outside dimensions, although I was asked to detail the inside of a chamber to my own taste but in fitting the Borg theme. And he definitely was able to put his own stamp on the work as it looks amazing. Someone would go on to build a model of a station and send pictures to Doug Drexler who would share them. We don't actually know who built that model, so if you do know, help us out and let us know in the comments. Copernicus Station would also be mentioned in the 2014 Star Trek comic Flesh and Stone, which saw all the Star Trek series Doctors in a single comic one-shot. This was set in 2380 and she's the Doctor as the Chief Medical Officer of Copernicus Station. A small little detail about the Borg Invasion 40 experience was that it not only did it bring back Kate Mulgrew, Robert Picardo and Alice Creek as Vice Admiral Janeway, the Doctor and the Borg Queen respectively, but also brought back the Borg from Star Trek First Contact to be filmed in the Borg segments of the filmed elements of the ride. Unfortunately, the Star Trek experience as a whole, including the Borg Invasion 4D, closed down in its 10th year in 2008. With shows like Star Trek Prodigy expanding towards the Delta Quadrant with Relay Station CR721 on the edge of Federation space, Copernicus Station at least couldn't come over to canon in the 2380s. But nothing has stopped the Copernicus Station possibly appearing in a future show. And let's see in a 25th century show, cementing its legacy maybe? You know what I'm saying, Star Trek Legacy, we'll have to wait and find out. What do you think of a Copernicus Station? Do you like its design? Would you like it to feature in a Star Trek show in the future? Or did you get to experience Star Trek for Borg Invasion 4D when it was open? Let us know in the comment section below, because as always, if you're talking about Star Trek, we would love to hear about it. If you want to keep up to date on the latest Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. For now, I've been Jack, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper my friends, goodbye.